<laughs> like, even by 19th century chemical standards, that makes no sense. Here's another old textbook I've got in my collection. Uh, and this one is uh, Popular Errors by John Timms. It is going to be probably the oldest book I own for a while, I think. Uh, says here 1856, and I've got no evidence to, that this was made after. So I think this is genuinely 150 years old. So let's try not to break it. I don't really know much about John Timms. There's not a lot of detail on him, apart from the fact that he's an author. And he wrote quite a few books like this, Curiosities, Trivia Books. Um, misconceptions uh, and a book called Things That Aren't Commonly Known. Um, basically kind of like maybe a 19th century QI or book of general ignorance type thing. So I don't know, maybe you could think of this guy as like the Stephen Fry of the 1850s, but uh, we'll see. He had some, he had some uh, wild, wild ideas. So this is just a book of just weird facts and misconceptions. And you can probably see from the number of posters I've added in, <laughs> I've found quite a few um, interesting ones. So I don't know, let's have a look at the, the back here, for instance, we've got a pretty uh, common one. This will pop up in trivia books. Of. Why are beef eaters at the Tower of London called beef eaters? Uh, and he's talking about whether they're named after the fact that they were paired in beef. Now, the thing is, we don't know whether that, that's true or not. A few others are really interesting ones. Think, we are whale bone. This substance is improperly named since it has none of the properties of bone. Its correct name is baleen. Oh, baleen? Baleen. Uh, and yeah, this is true. It is, uh, whale bone is a very flexible thing. It is probably got about the consistency of maybe the plastic you find in a zip tag. Because whale bone was used in corsets and garments a lot and it's remarkably flexible. It's not this huge, rigid, oppressive uh, substance that you you know think of when someone says whalebone corset. But I'm surprised to see it in the 19th century when that substance was still common. Uh, where else have we got here? Diamond, he's talking about the hardness of diamond. Uh, and apparently there was a rumor or something that you could soften diamond by steeping it in goat's blood. Uh, he says that's not true, it kind of isn't. Uh, but he does say that diamonds can wear out, they are not indestructible. Obviously, uh, diamonds aren't indestructible. You can shine them and polish them down, that's what jewellers do. So where are we here? The sensation of heat, this, I think, this is really good science, this one, because there cannot be a more fallacious means of estimating heat than by touch. Thus, in the ordinary state of an apartment at any season in the air, the objects which are in it will have the same temperature, and yet, to the touch, they will feel warm or cold in different degrees. The metallic objects will be coldest, stone and marble less so, wood less so, and carpeting and woolen objects will feel warm. In scientific terms, we will think of heat and temperature being slightly different. Heat is really a measure of energy or measuring energy transfer. Uh, temperature would be kind of related to the internal state of the, the matter or the object. So an object that feels hot is transferring a lot of heat energy to your skin uh, for your nerves to pick it up. You're certainly on the money there. Right, let's have a look at some of the, the wilder ideas though. Let's, let's see here, air quality. Considerable error prevails respecting the solubility. Salu salubrity? I'll have to look that up. Of the air of our metropolis, from ignorance of the fact ascertained by Mr. Cavendish many years since, that there is no sensible difference in the constituent parts of the atmosphere under circumstances the most dissimilar. So the Mr. Cavendish he's referring to is obviously Henry Cavendish. He figured out the constituent parts of uh, air, that being mostly nitrogen with some oxygen and then kind of this 1% left over. But in 1856, that 1% was not really well known. We knew, suspected there was another element or another material making up that remaining 1%. It's mostly argon, it turns out. And what Tims is referring to here with Cavendish is uh, that constituent of air doesn't actually change. The oxygen and nitrogen proportions in air really do not change appreciably anywhere on the planet. When it comes to human health, it's that 1% that is really the, the problem. 
uh, that contains the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and so on. Things that maybe in the 19th century they weren't able to uh, appreciably quantify. And that is very different between the country and the, the city. Probably one of the weakest bits he does is the citations at the bottom. It's really hard to pick up on what they are. And in this case, he simply cites a fact to the doctor. A book which directs people how to physic themselves ought to be entitled Every Man is His Own Poisoner because it cannot possibly teach them how to discriminate between the resemblance symptoms of different diseases. Uh, citation, uh, the doctor. So that's um, what we might call today the uh, kind of when doctors get really annoyed that you're Googling your own symptoms, I suppose. So some things haven't changed there. Thirst. This one was weird. It says, imaginary thirst. The development of a certain morbid feeling is often mistaken for thirst, to which there is a great analogy. Such is caused by the vicious habit of frequently drinking and the desire to taste some liquids as brandy and wine. Nothing produces thirst so much as quenching it or grows more readily into a habit than drinking. If you drink ethanol, it is a slight diuretic and it does make you feel thirsty afterwards and causes you to want to drink more. And if you do indulge in it, you will become an alcoholic. But he's not going to be using those terms because alcoholism, as a word, was only invented a couple of years before this book. It may not have been uh, popular enough for Tim's to have come across it. Uh, it would have probably been under the me uh, previous medical term for craving drugs, the dipsomania, which was the craving for alcohol and drugs um, that was coined like nearly 50 years before this book. So maybe that's just a code of reference to being an alcoholic, and it is true. If you indulge in that, it will get worse. This is a really uh, interesting one. So coal is more valuable than gold. So he's trying to say the natural supply of coal, Britain among the nations, is the most singularly favoured. Very 19th century, isn't it? Much of the surface of the country conceals under it continuous thick beds of that valuable material. Now, the exhaustion of British coal mines, the importance of coal as a, uh, as a necessary of life and the degree which our superiority in arts and manufactures depend upon our obtaining supplies of it at a cheap rate has naturally attracted a great deal of attention to the question as to the period when the exhaustion of our coal mines may be anticipated. <sighs> he does write some very, very long sentences, even by 19th century standards. But this this is a actually a key concern. We know now we are running out of oil. It is not going to last forever. Um, but his estimate here, according to Mr. Taylor, an experienced coal owner, the coal fields of Durham and Northumberland are ar are adequate to furnish the present annual supply for more than seventeen hundred years. Um, I don't think. Even if we were to extract all the coal, it goes anywhere near that. I, w I would love to try and look that up, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's like 100 years. Okay, I spent a while trying to get an answer to this one, and obviously it's complicated because there's a big difference between the amount of coal that we think might be under there, how much we definitely know is there, and how much we could realistically recover. And then you divide that by the rate of consumption, which is currently being phased down to zero, but has been significantly higher in the past. In any of those cases, we don't hit anywhere near 1700 years. It is therefore quite idle either to prohibit or impose heavy duties on the exploration of coal on the ground <laughs> of its accelerating the exhaustion of the mines. Yeah, this this is where the kind of uh, the mask is dipping about what this guy is on about. He would you you could very much see him as uh, kind of setting up one of those websites that says CO two is green, coal mining is great, sod the environment, it's all a con. Global warming is a myth. You can you can kind of see him getting into that vein, but 150 years early. Poor people and coal. Oh, yeah, waste of fuel. Gilbert White has well observed that the very poor are always the worst economists and therefore must continue very poor. The truth of which remark is strikingly evident in the mode in which the poorer classes use the fuel they have. This is sounding very, very familiar. You put some of this behind your radiators 
It really works. It makes the whole room nice and warm. I just want to point out that this isn't actually true. Indeed, poor, poor persons make less of the little fuel they have than the richer classes. Still, the poor must not be altogether blamed for the improvements in fireplaces by scientific men have done a great deal for the fireplaces of the rich, but nothing for the habitations of the poor. So, you know, at least he's blaming the poor for being terrible at fuel, but he's at least pointed out that they can only afford of the inefficient stuff. Okay, let's go for the big one. Why don't we? Let, let's have a look at this. This is kind of hilarious. Um, black skin. <laughs> Strap in. That the heat of the sun produces blackness of the integuments is an opinion as old as the days of Pliny. Buffon asserts that climate may be regarded as the chief cause of different colours of man, and Smith is of the opinion that from the pole to the equator we observe a graduation in the complexion nearly in proportion to the latitude of the country. Okay. Bloom and back under the same impression endeavours to account for this black tinge by a chemical illustration somewhat curious. He states that the proximate cause of dark skin is an abundance of carbon secreted by the skin with hydrogen precipitated and fixed by contact of the atmospheric oxygen. <laughs> Our Creoles and the British inhabitants of India uh, may have seen themselves particularly fortunate in not being subject to this chemical operation. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I, I don't know, even by 19th century chemical standards, that makes no sense. <laughs> you have a darker skin because you secrete carbon and it reacts. He's literally saying that they've burnt themselves black. And again, we can kind of see it here. Uh, in the present days of boasted liberty, it's more than probable that the benefits of the feudal system have been forgotten amidst its abuses. The system of servitude which prevailed in the earlier periods of our history was not that of unmitigated character that may be supposed. No man in those days could prey upon society unless he were at war with it as an outlaw. So basically, if you are glorified slave labour for the local lord, that's fine. Yeah, and I'm not, not convinced as a lot of people have, have challenged whether the feudal system has been uh, misremembered in some way. And in the fabric of society, imperfect as it was, the outline and rudiments of what ought to be were distinctly shown in some main parts, now well nigh utterly effaced. Uh, for anyone not remembering, the feudal system was basically a know your place hierarchy, kings, barons, lords and landowners, and then workers who would basically be locally governed and enthralled to those barons. Uh, it is a very stratified system, so moving between barons and lords and, and moving around the country was effectively impossible until the Black Death uh, reduced the population so much that labour demands uh, were really high and peasants could actually you know, move around and get a better deal because they were in short supply for the work. So the feudal system was kind of ended by, by that. If one class were regarded in some respects as cattle, they were at least taken care of. Oh, that's very, very good slave owners, isn't it? And while we're at it, let, let's see, the profits of medical advisors. It's a strange error to consider the profits of medical attendance to be uncommonly extravagant because this great apparent profit is frequently no more than the wages of labor. Okay, so far so Karl Marx. Uh, the skill of an apothecary is much nicer and more delicate matter than that of an artifice whatever, and the trust is reposed in him of much greater importance. His reward, therefore, ought to be proportionate to his skill and his trust. Mm. For example, the apparent extravagance of the charge of 18 pence for a draft file of medicine of <laughs> is obvious to many who do not reflect that the charge is in reality payment for professional skill. The 18 pence may be fairly divided into two parts, 4 pence for the medicine and 14 pence for the advice. Uh, yeah, so he basically he's defending massive medical markups on the ground that they're doctors and they train her well. Fair enough, but the medical markups he's talking about are huge. Basically, it almost puts the American healthcare system to shame here in the 19th century. You have to remember this is the UK, this is 
pre-NHS, this is even pre kind of the concept of medical insurance. This is everything the worst medical system you can imagine for a society amplified up a little bit. So this is, uh, this is common errors, um, a little bit, well, not 100% accurate in terms of fact, there's some screamers in here, uh, and also uh, some weird kind of political motivation. So he's clearly sat down and just scribbled his opinions down uh, in a few ways. We've got things on English gluttony, uh, carrying a dark lanthorn, the right of gleaning, uh, lots of laws and his opinions on laws. It's kind of really weird to read through, but fascinating insight into the mind of, of the 19th century.